Good morning. Welcome to church. My name's Wendy and I'm on the pastoral staff team here at Sutton Vineyard. We'd love to know you're with us this morning. Welcome if it's the first time you've been. Please let us know you're here. Just uh, say hello on the chat screen on the right hand side of the page. Our lovely welcome team are already there and be ready to say hello to you. And in fact, they'll hang around for 10 minutes or so at the end of the service to continue to chat or perhaps even to answer your questions. If you're looking to connect into Sutton Vineyard as your church, then we'd love to help you do that. And if you click on the link uh, in the description bar at the bottom, then uh, Bev, our senior pastor, will be in touch with you. Now, our youth and kids sessions premiere every weekend on YouTube. Uh, and this week, they're starting a new series called Even Me, which is about how God uses ordinary people. Sounds exciting. But if you miss the premiere, no worries, because the videos stay on YouTube and you can catch up with them anytime at your convenience. In fact, you can catch up with everything that's happening in Sutton Vineyard on our website. Uh, if you go to that and also on our social media, Facebook, Instagram and on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you in this time. So whoever you are, parents, youth, kids, We'd love to hear from you. Send us your stories, send us your pictures, your videos. Send everything to stories at suttonvineyard.org. Now then, most of us give online to the work of the church. And um, if you're wanting to do that this morning to make a donation to the ministry, then you can do that by again clicking on that link at the bottom of the page and there'll be instructions there to show you what to do. We're going to have a few updates and then Jason, our senior pastor, will be starting our new teaching series which is called Choose Joy and is based in the letter to the Philippians. After that we'll have a time of worship together and an opportunity to pray together. Now then, small groups are the heartbeat of Sutton Vineyard Church and this week Bev, our senior pastor, has been talking to some small group leaders. Good morning. We have our lovely small group leaders here today, some of them anyway, and I'm just going to ask them questions about small groups and just get to know them a little bit better. And you'll get to know them a little bit better and what our small groups are about. So I've got a few questions to ask them. Oh, let me introduce you. So we have Neil and Becky. Becky's got the coloured hair. Uh, we have the Durrants. <laughs> I don't know which corner you're going to be on, but the Durrants are in the left-hand corner and the Bowdens are in the right-hand corner. <laughs> Sounds like a quiz show, doesn't it? <laughs> so the first question I want to ask you is, what is the best thing about being in a small group? I think given being in a church the size of our church, it's very difficult to get to know people and to also be known. Yes. Whereas I think a small group is great for that because you get to know a small number of people and you can get to know them quite well. I think it's a place where you can do life together, you can pray for each other and it's a place you can be real. So whatever's going on in life and whatever you choose to say, it's fine. You know, whether you're a Christian, a new Christian, you've been a Christian for years, I think it's a great place to meet with other people and share those experiences. Wow. It's the whole real thing of being really vulnerable that actually um, it's that realisation that none of us have got it sorted. We're all on a journey. And I think on a Sunday, people are so busy doing teams or, or kind of picking up kids or got to get off and meet people that actually come in the week. It's just so wonderful to just exhale together. <laughs> and just go, this is where I'm at, this is what's going on. And I think it's just so wonderful, even as leaders, to kind of go, we haven't got it all sorted. You know, have. we don't know all the answers. Yeah. And actually, we're all in it together. And I think it's just wonderful to just be able to pick people up and just kind of go, okay, when I'm strong, I'm going to hold you. And when we're feeling weak, the rest of the small group bolster us. And I think... It's just wonderful to be real, as Alison said, that actually we are all in this together, however long we've been a Christian, none yeah. of us have got it completely together. And I think that's a real leveller, whether yeah. you've yeah. just become a Christian or have been a Christian for years, it's so good to go, I'm struggling, <laughs> I don't know the answer. 
for me, a small group is where you make true friends. There's always someone there that you really click with. And wherever you go in life, you sort of like Alison and David, we were in a small group together years back, weren't mm. we? But I could really say they're friends. So if we yeah. need them, they need us, here we are. It's yeah. really sort of cementing relationships. Great. Next question. Do you have any stories or memories about how a house group, small group has helped you? encouraged you uh, uh, well we've recently had a, a lot of major issues going on with almost everybody in our home group um <laughs> including us um and in fact we've been helped and encouraged by the support that we've had knowing that yeah. they're actually praying for us um and then all during the day you know you get the odd text messages coming through how are you getting on any updates um so that's been very very supportive um and also uh, within our group it's been very encouraging to see um, other members of our group taking um, a role in leading the group um, and also being able to practice their spiritual gifts in a in a safe environment yeah right we've seen quite a lot of that fairly recently in particular with one of our members that has been um having a lot of pictures and things that they've not had before and they've been amazing some really amazing pictures in there so we yeah. quite often get a text uh, probably once a week saying i've had another vision can i run it by you <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah. just love watching people grow yeah just lovely um i mean relationships obviously really valuable and and treasured but uh uh, I think that gives me real joy is just over a period of time seeing people in the group grow mm -hmm. and um, yeah see that people become increasingly established in their faith established yeah. in in the uh, in the community of the church um, and uh, and and in their love for Jesus um, yeah one memory I have is the very first small group I went to which was the lovely Duncan and Lawners mm -hmm. and I went for months and didn't say a word and they were just lovely. They let me eat their cake, drink their tea, say nothing <laughs> in the corner. Um, but somehow I felt they loved me. And I've never seen that kind of um, put into action before. Normally you yeah. don't love somebody you don't know, but I really did feel that they loved me. Yeah. And that hadn't happened in my life before. That's lovely. Yeah. yeah. That was a really important introduction yeah. for Julie yeah. Um, yeah. back in the day yeah. uh, when, when small group was... Yeah, pretty so, daunting. It's something very strange. Yeah. <laughs> it's great seeing the connections between our small group members. Sometimes in the past when we've done small groups, it's quite top down. They always members look to us. Yeah. And but the group we have at the moment are making links with each other. They're meeting up. They're having their own conversations. There's one member who, not long after lockdown happened, she was still out and about and was able to replicate the snacks that we were going to have for small groups. So she'd leave little <laughs> parcels at the small oh. group members so that when we had small group, they could have Doritos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Uh, and my last question to you is, why would anyone ever join a small group? Why do you think they should? There's no better time than now. Oh my gosh, don't we all need support and each yeah. other? Yeah. And now we're mm. just there for each other. Now is the time. Yeah. Mm. I think it's about widening and deepening. Widening the the group the group of people who you the, who you know. You know, just just fellow Christians meeting together, just widening that group of relationships and deepening those relationships. Mm but also widening and deepening in terms of actually in terms of knowledge and in terms of um just encounter with god I, I think that particularly at the moment when we're not meeting on a sunday meeting albeit you know virtually zooming into one another um mm -hmm. i think it's really key that we're meeting but it's it's also a means that we're that we're widening our, our knowledge and experience of god and being encouraged to deepen that I put down that it's a place to connect to others, to be known, a place to encourage and be encouraged. And I thought the Vineyard Statement sums it up by saying, helping people into their first and next encounter with God. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just being part of God's family. You know, I think even though on a Sunday, it's, it's you are part of the extended family. I think we always class our small group as a family. 
and actually we welcome people into the family and it, it's lovely because our children are involved so we do a lot of socials so actually the kids they, they know the children and you know even making they come and make the tea and they're part of it and i think that's really lovely especially as we've got a lot of people who live on their own in our small group and most of them are in one single room bless them they're all going absolutely stir yeah. crazy yeah, so right. it's lovely for them to feel connected to people who maybe they've got family miles away and so they belong and then yeah. when people feel that they belong in a small group they then can connect into church and then get on teams and feel like they they are somebody and it, it's just lovely to kind of just envelop people and kind of go it's okay you know this is your tribe as it were and that's for us what we love mm. doing in our small group that's so. fabulous well thank you lovely small group leaders thank you for taking some time out and chatting to me uh and i'll see you online again at some point yeah <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> so there you are and now is the time if you want to be feel loved and don't we all if you want to be supported included and feel part of things then you need to join a small group and if that's your decision and you haven't done it before then go to that link that we've mentioned before to click on that and Bev will be in touch with you and introduce you to a small group now, I want to spend a few moments this morning talking to you about prayer. How is your prayer life? It's such an important time to be praying. Uh, Christians, if we don't pray, nobody else is going to. There's so many situations in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. And on the bigger picture, the things Jason said in his talk last week, and that's still available online if you missed it, uh, that the world itself is in such a tipping point, such a crisis place, that we need to pray. We need to pray for God's kingdom to come. Now, uh, back at the beginning of lockdown, we were providing a resource that we called 747, which were prayers that we uh, wrote to help you connect at seven o'clock every evening to pray. Uh, but now we'd like to suggest that you find the resource that best suits you from the many that are available. And there's a page on our website devoted to prayer headed up prayer look for that strangely enough and on that you'll find lots of hints and resources for prayer and lots of uh, links to appropriate prayer sites and encouragements that you might find helpful now on that is a link to an app called Lectio 365 which is a particular favorite of mine at the moment I use it every morning it's provided by the 24 7 prayer organization and it's a lovely way to be led through prayers for the day to pray for yourself and your own situation, your walk with God, but also to give you a wider glimpse of the, the bigger picture as well. I love that. But also there's one you may not have come across, a website called Unite714. Now this is interesting. There's a very known, well-known scripture that uh, many of us will know that comes from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. That's 714. And it's the most fantastic promise from God. It says basically this, if if my people who are called by name, my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. <clears throat> An amazing promise. And this Unite organization has taken this scripture and has suggested that churches all around the world are signed up to this, that we set aside an alarm on our clocks, watches for 714, 714 in the morning, or 7.14 in the evening, or both, and pray. And there are suggestions on their website as to how we can pray. But the idea is that churches in on every continent, right around the globe, are setting their alarms for 7.14. And hence, because of our different time zones, there's a link in prayer, 24 hours, um, going right the way around the world. So it's this lovely picture of linking hands with the time zone before you and the time zone after you, as we all pray at a set time and pray for God's kingdom to come on this earth. So that's Unite 714. That might capture your imagination and help you to be motivated to join in a worldwide global prayer network. Now on our website as well, you'll find that there's actually an opportunity to write a written prayer request and send it in to us. And we will pray. We will pray for you. We will pray with you. Uh, so we want to hear from you. 
Uh, how is your prayer life? Is there anything else we could be doing that would be helpful? Have you any suggestions as to what would help you? And again, email us if you want to know more about the prayer spaces that are available in church, uh, as well as the prayer space that you find in your small group. So, let's pray. Father, we know you long to hear our prayers. We know that the prayers of the saints arise before your throne like a sweet-smelling incense. Holy Spirit, help us to pray. And as we move on in our service, Lord, may your spirit and your presence be upon the word, your word of scripture. May it challenge and encourage us. May our worship Bless our hearts and souls and bless you as you listen. And Father, may your presence be with each one of us wherever we are at this moment. Amen. Philippians 1, verses 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving and prayer. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Thank you, Lucy, for our Bible reading today. Um, And welcome, everyone. Uh, My name's Jason, Senior Pastor, with my wife, Beverly at Sutton Vineyard Church um, and I'm very excited today as I introduce a new series called Choose Joy and we're going to be going through the book of Philippians. Um, If you want to listen to this again uh, you can go online to suttonvineyard.org and catch this up and all our previous talks. I'm excited for a lot of reasons. Firstly this book is one that we went through as a church uh, when we, uh, gosh, just over 20 years ago, we first went through this, the whole book, um, and a prize for anyone still in our church who's got a handout from back in the day can put something in the YouTube comments. Um, it's also a book when I was doing my theology degree a long time ago. I had to go through it in Greek. I don't remember the Greek, but I remember being profoundly impacted uh, by it and what an amazing uh, book um, it is. And um, But most of all, the reason we're using this book is the core preaching team, as we've been meeting and praying and thinking about what uh, the Lord would uh, want to bless us with and impact us with at this time. This book uh, kept coming to mind because um, the context for this book is it's called the Book of Joy, uh, the word joy appears over 50 times um, through it. And um, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul writing this, is in prison unexpectedly and having a hard time. And the church he writes to, the Philippian church, are facing a huge amount of persecution and very difficult circumstances. And this is a book that's about, in the midst of very challenging circumstances, how God has joy for us. So that seemed um, appropriate and apt for us with the challenges that we're facing and we're going to continue to face. And we believe as we go through this, we hope your journey with us and continue through this whole series with us, you'll discover that same joy that Jesus has for us. Um, So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about what joy is and what Paul will be talking about as an overview to the book. And then I've got three things I'm going to share with you. Um, The first thing about joy is, uh, as I said, it's mentioned 50 times in this book. We're, We're used to a word we use a lot more, quite a a modern invention as a word happiness um, and we talk about that a lot Um, and the word happiness comes from an old English word called happenstance Uh, and happenstance is uh, is very similar to the word circumstance and our happiness is literally um, 
how we feel based on our circumstances. And you could say it's a bit of an obsession in our Western uh, world. Uh, we want to be happy and we want our circumstances to be better. Um, but Paul doesn't talk about happiness in this book. Um, it's not that he's not concerned about it, but it was a word that really wouldn't have been used uh, in those days. But, but joy was something that Paul was more concerned about, despite the circumstances that he was facing. Um, and we're going to find that there are, there are three layers as we work through the book of Philippians, that Christians have understood how life works. The first one is our circumstances. Um, and we can go through life solely on the basis of what we have and what we experience. And that determines who we are. And that's a pretty difficult way to go through life, pretty poor and impoverished way to go through life. Um, some of us have got friends, if not have experienced it ourselves, they move to a different circumstance, change their circumstances, and they discover that they took themselves with them. Uh, so circumstances and changes in our circumstances is not always the best for us, even though there are times when obviously our circumstances do need to be better. But that's the first layer of life. The second layer of life is about how we respond to our circumstances. That uh, And uh, not just Christians have discovered in history that we can choose how we respond. Uh, and we're going to discover in this book there's a lot about choosing joy. Uh, that, again, that's the title for this series, that we are not um, at the mercy of our circumstances, but we can transcend them in Jesus and we can choose our responses. But there's a third layer that we're going to press into. Again, Christians have really understood this in Christian spirituality through history. And by that, I mean what it means to be vital and alive before God and live a life of meaning and purpose. The most fundamental place is a layer underneath our responses, and that is the layer of our identity, the deepest part of who we are, being rooted in something that, that doesn't that, that from which everything flows and allows us to respond differently in life and our circumstances. One way to understand that, that process, and as we, we unpack this in Philippians, one of the ways to tell if we're too focused on our circumstances is that we are tossed around all the time. Um, and we're not anchored in something. One of the ways to know if we, our identity is in something beyond our circumstances is that, yes, we feel the, the pains and the ups and downs of our circumstances, but there is a solidity to who we are, and we're able to face life and go through life and choose how we respond. That's what Paul's got for us. And I was thinking about how I ground that con concept in something that we might all be able to relate to. Um, if you ask most parents, would they take a bullet for their child? The answer is yes. I wouldn't even think about it's a reflex. The core of who I am as a father goes so deep that I wouldn't even have to think to step in the way of a, that, uh, the proverbial bullet for my child. Um, I'd give up everything without considering it because who they are is core to who I am. Now, that place is also the place that we can have a connection with Jesus. And this may surprise some of you. Um, some of you are exploring who Jesus is as you watch this. Some of us have known about Jesus for a long time. Jesus is not something for our circumstances. And often our relationship with Jesus is about him improving our circumstances. But what you're going to see in the book of Philippians, Paul tells us that there is a place where we can know Jesus here in the core of who we are and love him and be connected to him in just as much as we can, if not more than our family uh, or our children. And that's the invitation that we have, and that's the place that joy flows from, no matter our situation and our feelings. It's also a certain kind of joy that Paul talks about here. Um, it's as we go through scripture this this joy is uh, is mapped out for us um, joy is deliverance by God joy is rescue there you go that is part of our circumstances but it's also hope uh, it's also um, something that springs out of us because of the hope that we have it's about connection and relationship and it, and like love Joy is something that multiplies. Um, you, you never have too much love and you can never have too much joy. And Paul's saying this is available to us in the face of overwhelming circumstances. So that's a quick orientation to the series. I hope you'll follow along with us. And now I want to share three things with you um, uh, from this passage, um, in particular from verses 3 through to 11. The first one's going to be about people. The second one is God's sovereignty. And the third one is how to pray. 
Um, first one on people. Um, Paul begins about his amazing memories. I mean, he's in the midst of this awful situation. He could focus on how awful prison is. He could focus on how awful their circumstances are. But the, but the first thing he does is he talks about his love for them and his memories of them and how he wants to be reconnected uh, with them. I've been thinking how that's helped me at this time. Um, and by the way, those of you watching this from Sutton Vineyard Church, it's getting to the point I really miss you. Um, so many weeks, I realise other than my other than my wife and my daughter hugging somebody else, and I just I miss you guys, really miss you, and I am praying for you, and I think about you daily as I pray for you, and you come to mind, and I, I can't wait till we can meet together again. And, and Paul writes with, with something even bigger for his love for this uh, church that he knows uh, and, and just is desperate to see them uh, experience joy in the midst of their suffering. Um, and it's uh, what a great place for Paul to start relationships and love. Um, and Paul says, no matter what our situation and circumstances, start from there. As I said, we know for our children we'll face many things, for our partners we'll face many things. But for Jesus, we can have such deep love and connection to him that that is the way to navigate our circumstances. And that's where Paul begins. And he talks about, I'm going to move on to in a moment, um, that love for these people in this church flows from his love and his experience of Jesus and theirs for him. And by the way, it's never too late to cultivate relationships. Um, the, uh, the origins of human beings focusing on their circumstances for their happiness would be Adam and Eve uh, in the story at the beginning of Eden. And, and, in, and, and as their circumstances unfold uh, and they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the more they understand about the world and the more they try to control it and they withdraw from God instead of pressing into their relationship with him and we're just the same in the midst of overwhelming circumstances we often uh, will withdraw we're tired we withdraw we're busy we withdraw we're under pressure in a pandemic and we withdraw but we can lean into relationships now now is the time to lean into relationships in the faces of any losses that we may have don't hide away second thing uh, we've got uh, verses uh, 6 here, um, the sovereignty of God. Um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll reread this now at this point. Um, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This um, amazing reminder. Um, Paul could focus on his imprisonment. He could lament it here and his need for release. Um, but he doesn't. Paul, Paul's also not doing some sort of Christian denial as if this doesn't matter. Um, and also the church that he writes to with the suffering that they're facing. Um, he doesn't dwell on it. And you and I, a lot of the time when we ask how each other are, we focus on our circumstances. We say, could you pray that they would change? Paul goes to a completely different level uh, with them and in, instead in, in verse 6 he chooses to see what Jesus is doing and remind them of that he sees God at work no matter what their circumstances are God is active and you and I can often uh, fear that God is not at work um, again, I keep thinking sometimes, how would God be mindful of me in the middle of a global pandemic? It's difficult enough at the best of times to sometimes think when we're struggling, why would God have any attention to me? And scripture tells us that he does. But when the whole world is caught up in this, how would God be at at work in our lives and some of you are facing some challenging times and, and struggling with them and wondering what's going to happen or where there's uncertainty about the future and we can hear as Paul would hear to the Philippian church God is at work that's the place to focus he really is at work um, there is nothing we can do to control things or fix things God is at work and a lot of the time we go through life with the illusion that we are in control um, and one of the things many of us are facing is loss of control. We had our plans and we have, and, and especially in the Western world, we, you know, we are masters of our diaries and what we do and what we're able to do in a way that people in history have never been able to do. And it's a shock to us when suddenly uh, everything changes and it's beyond our control. I had an interview with a, a doctor, a hospital doctor, talking about how he had to face death daily in, in the, the line, in the, in the, place of medicine that he was working um, 
but he said he'd always thought he was in control. He was smart enough and organised enough, and even though he faced death daily, um, he just sort of had that feeling that he was in control. And then he was absolutely overwhelmed one day in responding to patients dying from COVID. And he said as he looked around and surveyed all of this, he realised that he was not in control, and he never really had been in control before, and it was the illusion that we give ourselves for life. But God is in control is the truth of scripture. So if you're feeling that disjunction right now and that like, oh, everything's out of control and God's not. No, uh, most Christians through history have lived through far worse than you and I have. And they knew God was in control. And that sense that my life is a mess, what it usually means is my life is not doing what I had decided it would do. That's not the same as God being in control. And you know what? I faced significant abuse when I was a child and financial peril. Um, and I dealt with it by being a workaholic because I learned that if it was to be, it was going to be up to me. And I had to literally work for survival. Um, but the problem is a coping mechanism when I was a kid in the midst of that, I've overlaid over the years on my relationship with the Lord. And, and that's where my workaholism and I'm a recovering workaholic. Um, still, even though things are much better in my life. And the Lord recently said to me something. He said, Jason, I want you to, uh, just the thought process went quickly through my head, to journal and write down in my prayer times the best things in my life that I was grateful for. Uh, and I did that. And as I did that, I started to see a pattern that every single amazing thing in my life was something that I did not make happen. The house I ended up living in near the church where I became a Christian because the aunt who invited my mother to church, going to London School of Theology and meeting Bev and John Wright, uh, who's now National Director for Vineyard Churches and getting into the Vineyard Church movement for where how we ended up planting in Sutton and this just amazing, beautiful church that we love, never expected to plant in in Sutton and the teaching and stuff that I get to do um, outside of church I never could have imagined uh, in my life was going to happen uh, and more than that there are so many things that I see God at work in my life at times when I felt like I was on my own and I never was so relationships the sovereignty of God and praying with joy uh, verses 9 through 11 here so um, Paul moves on to to talk about how to pray and he prays with joy and again we've already seen he doesn't say pray for my release he doesn't say I'm going to pray for your situation we know he cares about it he mentions it and we we, we know that he wanted to be released from prison for the gospel but Paul focuses presses down in verse 8 into this love that he has it's the love that he's already mentioned remember he said in verse 3 I thank my God every time I remember you he says in verse 7 it's right for me to feel this way about you um, and he says that and he praise that that love may abound more and more it's just this astonishing love that he has for them but I say in verse 8 there is this I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus the actual word that Paul uses here in in the Greek is a uh, splankna um, and the way that people at that time understood the seat of your emotions they were they were called what noble organs um, and they were the hearts the lung and the liver and there was that sense of I love you from that place my heart, my lungs and my liver where the most pure, deep love emerges from. And what Paul's saying in verse 8 here is that place of love is the affection of Christ. That's the place that God loves us. Not just in his head, but Jesus in that most deep part of his identity loved us. And Paul's connected to Jesus there and connected to these people. And that's the place that Paul generates his prayer um, for them. And, and he prays out of that place and space. And by the way, again, this is not cold conceptual comfort like pie in the sky when you die and not about our circumstances. Paul is saying that if we experience this as he prays, it changes everything. It changes how we respond to life and it changes what God brings into our circumstances. Remember what I said at the beginning? Um, and it's so counterintuitive for many of us how we're used to doing life. So going all the way into that deepest place and the core and identity uh, of a relationship with Jesus. This is where Paul teaching us to pray. Um, and again, trying to translate that into something concrete. It made me think, um, if you said to me, would, you know, if I knew my wife was about to die from some horrible illness and let's just say it was possible that I could give up everything 
and somehow that would fund the one miracle cure that would save a life. I would not even think about it. The love of my life, I would give up everything for, including my future. That's the place that Paul's praying from. That's what's at stake here as he prays for these people that he loves. So let's just wrap up looking at these prayers. Paul says about these prayers, he says, he prays for them about um, their love would grow in depth of insight. Not a soppy love. This is not sentimental love. It's a love that brings understanding. Um, one of the things that we're finding is the psychologists know this. Uncertainty is, is actually causes us a great deal of psychological discomfort and pain. We would rather know something bad was coming and when it was coming than live with uncertainty. And some of you feel that. You're like, well, nothing bad's happened to me yet. Why am I, maybe, why is this so difficult? Because that's what uncertainty does with us. Um, and actually, you know, scaring the news and information and listening to people. Some of you are finding that we're, it's like we're, we're trying to eat like Adam and Eve from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're finding that more information is not making us feel better it's making us more fearful and that's why Paul starts with love the love of God of the creator of the universe in Jesus is the place some of us do this with our kids our kids have overwhelming circumstances and it is not cold comfort when we go to them and we say I love you I'm here for you some of you have known parents who've been like that to you and you've been able to feel that that's what Paul is praying into here. A love that no matter what happens, we can face anything. And then Paul prays that we would discern what is best. Literally, um, the word there is about the testing of precious metals for their quality so that we would value what's best. And Paul says in the midst of everything you're facing, it is really important to be able to discern God's best at this time instead of settling for something else. And then uh, last technical bit, and then I'm going to wrap this up. Um, being filled with righteousness is a strange word, isn't it? We usually use it in the negative and it means someone is being self-righteous. Um, and it means many things in the Bible. But for here and this passage, passage and what we're talking about see if you can do this little bit of work with me here it's about the ordering and the nature of relationships in the face of suffering it's about something from the future that makes struggles in the present have meaning and purpose so an example would be soldiers in battle who are facing death um, and we still give thanks don't we for soldiers uh, men and women who gave their lives in the second world war so that we could have the life that we have now and it's that sense of it that there is whilst this is horrible and wrong there is a rightness in what i'm going through due to what god is going to bring from the future into my present and some of us have a sense of things not being right that we're out of sorts and displaced and that's true our circumstances have changed and it wasn't what we expected but some of you are starting to tap into because of the volume and the intensity of what god is doing at this time in history through this we're also starting to sense that things are out of kilter in our struggles because the kingdom of God is at hand and Jesus is at hand and the righteousness of Jesus is available to us. Now, taking all those things in prayer, let me turn them this way with one, with one thing. I want to reverse engineer those um, into response. Lots of people asking me how I am. Lots of people are probably asking you how you are. And we've got lots of responses that we make, don't we? Um, uh, but imagine if Paul had been writing this letter to us and imagine he'd been praying these prayers for us what might those prayers being answered look like in your life and my life does that make sense i think it might look something like this when and i'm going to use it this way someone says to you how are you and you say do you know what these prayers are being prayed for me in this way like paul did and here's the result of those prayers and it might be this my experience and understanding of god's love just seem to have grown and grown something is happening the things that used to grip me and consume me and bother me just don't bother me anymore so many things have less hold over me and i'm realizing that i need them less and less and even if i could go back to them i sort of don't want to i was all out of sorts and i was you know sort of displaced and this feeling like this was a bad dream i couldn't wake up from and i felt dislocated from everything and then suddenly this this peace beyond my circumstances 
And I just knew that I was right with God and he was right with me. I mean like next to him and close to him, but I mean more than that. I mean I was right with him. I was right in my relationship with him in a way I've not been before and everything's going to be all right. I'm going to be okay because he has me and I have him. How does that sound? That's what Paul was praying for the Philippian church and it's what he would pray for us. So my suggestion in your homework is this, um, whilst we bring our circumstances to the Lord and our emotions and our struggles, why don't we pray these things that Paul prayed and see what the Lord brings us, see what he brings you. So in summary, where's your focus? Where's your focus to get through this time? Is it on relationships with God and one another and pressing into the opportunity for the just most amazing special connection with Jesus? Don't withdraw. Second thing, are you seeing God's work in you, that he is sovereign no matter what's happening, that he has a work that he wants to do in you that, that we can discover uh, no matter what our circumstances are? And the third thing here, turning our prayers like Paul does that would produce joy in our life. So let me pray. Lord, uh, thank you for this book. And we pray as we go through it, we discover joy. And we pray that the truth of who Jesus is and what's available to us in him would just be freed up in us and released up in us as we press into this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Join us this morning as we worship God and find a place where you're comfortable, where you can sit, stand, kneel, lay down, whatever you want to do to get into a place where you're ready to receive what God has for you this morning. Come, let us worship. Who you are when I'm loved by you 
sake of you my king I'm giving you my dreams I'm laying down my rights I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life and I surrender all to you all to you song I'm waiting at the cross and all the world holds dear I count it all as lost for the sake of knowing you the glory of your name to know the lasting joy even sharing in your pain
Thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lorraine, Lorraine Stipadak, and I'm part of the preaching team here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been wonderful to have you. Um, our lovely welcome team, I will be in the chat room afterwards for about 10 minutes after the service. Um, so if you would like to say hello, please pop along to the chat as we close up our service. Um, so do head on over there. Um, it's possible that you experience God's love for you this morning for the first time, or maybe you experience God's love for you and you heard about God's love for you for the hundredth time this morning. Um, God's love is sincere and whichever time that is, it's always real. Um, I'd just like to encourage you as we finish our service this morning, uh, thinking and reflecting upon the service this morning. Um, God is at work even, even in these times. God's ways are not our ways and his view is not our view. Um, he sees all, he knows all, we know only in part. Um, this part of history, our history, is, is not surprising to God and he wants us to thrive despite it, because of it, in it. Um, God doesn't break his promises and God doesn't fail. God doesn't fail, he is good. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. Before COVID, during COVID, after COVID. Perhaps God might be speaking to you right now in the quiet of your own home. Perhaps he's speaking to you in the chaos of your own home. This may be um, a sense of peace that you have. Maybe you have a still, small quiet voice speaking to you. Perhaps it's just a sense you get within your body. Um, some people experience this kind of fluttering um, of their eyelids. Other people experience um, God as their body gets hot. Um, and you may feel like your body is relaxing uh, or you may feel nothing. And all of these things are absolutely fine. Wherever you are now, I would just encourage you to just keep connecting and to keep reaching out to God for he will, he promises that he will meet us where we are if we truly seek him. If you want to re reach out your hands, the practice that we have here is that you, we would reach out our hands um, and you can um, adopt a position of prayer if you want to. Um, the song that I had going through my mind um, is the fantastic hymn um, it is well, um, it is well with my soul and the thought that um, the righteousness of God will be upon you that lingered with me after this morning um, and it will be well, it will be well, it will be well with my soul. Um, if you are requiring some prayer this morning, um, normally we'd have people around us at church, but actually you may have people around you in your home. Um, ask them to reach out a hand and place a hand on you and pray for you. Um, family, friends, your kids, if you have needs this morning, um, you may have needs that are physical needs for healing. God loves to heal. We heard fantastic stories in recent weeks um, of healing. Um, God wants to heal. And if you have a need, don't leave this morning uh, without going to him and asking asking for prayer. So ask a family member um, to put out their hand and to pray for you this morning. Lord, I pray and thank you so much for your beauty. Thank you for your love. I pray for Everybody is listening to this, Lord God, whether it's this morning on the live stream or later on. Lord Jesus, I pray for your hand to be upon them, for them to meet you in all of your fullness, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. I pray for your blessing and your peace and your providence. Just get that word. Um, to be poured out upon your people. And again, like I said just now, if it's for the first time or if it's for the hundredth time, Lord, we pray for your blessing and for your Holy Spirit to be poured out among your people. 
We praise you this morning, Lord. Amen. As we draw our service to a close, um, please do um, have a think and consider if you, um, I'm not in a small group this morning, um, uh, they are meeting throughout the week still virtually. If you're not in a small group, then please do um, have a look on the um, website and find out in the details in the description below um, and find a small group, join in. Um, we run a small group, <laughs> lots of small groups are happening throughout the week. So do get connected and um, continue the journey with us um, throughout the week, not just on Sunday mornings. It's a really important and really special place to get connected. Um, and throughout the week, if you um, want to request prayer or you um, need some support, do go to our website and one of our team will be in touch. There's a care section of the website and you can have a look at that and see where it's appropriate for you to get uh, to go to get in touch and receive some help and support. Um, and finally, if you are visiting, then incredibly well, you're incredibly welcome this morning. Um, if you've come in for the first time, then we would love to connect with you. So do click on the link in the description um, and we will be in touch with you. Um, and of course, if you want to say hello in, to the welcome team, they'll be around for about 10 minutes after the service. Um, so that's almost it for our service this morning, um, but do um, check us out on social media. Um, if you want to find out what's going on in the life of the church, then please do go to the website or follow us on social media, um, Facebook and Instagram, um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, next week, we are starting a, we're, sorry, continuing in our series at 10.15, so we'd love to welcome you back on Sunday morning. Um, the series is called Choose Joy, and it's on Philippians, um, so we'll see what next week has in store and what God has for us this week. Um, so it's final goodbye from me, and I just want to um, pray a blessing over everybody who is, who is listening this morning or this afternoon, or whenever it is that you happen to catch this. So Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everything that you have done and that you are doing. Lord, we just look to you as our true light, our true righteousness, and our true love. In Jesus' name, Amen.